corruption. Corruption is moral perversion. It is the departure from that which is pure or correct. Corruption can also mean inducement to do wrong by bribery or other unlawful or improper means. Those who sell political favors to the highest bidder are corrupt. Quite simply put, to corrupt someone is to change them from good to bad in morals, manners, or actions. Corruption often results in ruin or destruction, and therefore is something that we should all be aware of and should all guard against. We don't have to look very far to find corruption in the world today. Perversion is rampant. Judges make decisions based on precedent rather than on what is right or wrong. The vote of many politicians is for sale to the highest bidder. Uh, the bidders are called lobbyists in Washington, D.C. Today I want us to take a look at what causes corruption. Some folks who we think of very highly in the Bible, such as King Solomon, are subject to corruption. Open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 1. Some 15 kings and one queen, that being Athaliah, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, after Solomon we came to a very righteous, pious king, Josiah by name. Josiah was named by God 360 years before he was born and of the idolatry that he would put an, an end to uh, and kind of bring you up to where we are here in, in chapter 22 of 2 Kings. That's where they found the high priest, uh, found Hilkiah by name, found the law. <gasps> Go think, the word of God, they found it in the tabernacle. But they couldn't understand it. They tried to read it. They took it to Huldah, a prophetess. And she told them, we're in big trouble. The idolatry is running rampant. The perversion is running rampant in our nation. And we're going to pay for it. God promised Josiah, I won't bring the calamity that I'm going to bring on Israel while you're still alive. Josiah could have just rested on his laurels and said, well, oh boy, lucky me. I don't have to suffer the calamity that's coming on all you other suckers. That's not what he did. He took it on himself to start a religious reformation. That's where we pick it up. 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 1, we ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. And the king, and this is Josiah, sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah, uh, of Jerusalem, and of Jerusalem. Verse 2. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him. And the priest and the prophets, Jeremiah and Zedekiah, were probably there. And all the people, both small and great, that put for all of them. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. When you want to know what you should do, read the word of God. It instructs us on how to be pleasing to our heavenly father. Josiah is hoping that God will see the repentance on the part of the people and change his mind about the calamity that he promised to bring upon Israel. And the king stood by a pillar, this being the brazen scaffold that was installed at the time of Solomon and used by many of the kings since, and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord 
and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people stood, in the, stood to the covenant. They stood firm in agreement that this was a good thing that Josiah was calling the people to do. Verse 4, And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest, and the priest of the second order. This means that they were Levitical priests, just not the high priest. And the keepers of the door, the porters, also Levites, to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove. This is Asherah in the Hebrew, the male phallic symbol worshipers. And for all the host of heaven, angel worship. And he burned them, that's the law, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 25. Burn the idols. Them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron. This is a valley northeast of Jerusalem. And carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. Bethel was one of the places that they set up golden calves to worship shortly after the nation split. They put one golden calf in Dan and one in Bethel. You don't need to go down to Jerusalem to worship Yahweh. Come down and do it here at our local golden calf. The purpose of taking ashes there was to desecrate it, to defile it, to where people wouldn't use it anymore. And he put down, this is to cause to cease in the Hebrew, the idolatrous priest whom the kings of Judah had ordained. Did it say who God had ordained? No, the kings of Judah ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem. Them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all the hosts of heaven, the constellations, the 12 signs of the zodiac, the moon, the sun. Genesis chapter one, God said, I'll put lights in heaven to divide the day from the night and for seasons, for signs, but not to be worshiped. We certainly don't wanna worship the solar eclipse that's happening tomorrow. That would be uh, abomination, verse six. And he brought out the grove, this is the Asherah, from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem uh, unto the brook Kidron and burned it at the brook Kidron and stamped it small to powder and cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. These were the uh, false prophets, the idolatrous uh, priests. And what he's doing by strewing these ashes is desecrating them. That was also prophesied some 360 years before as well. Verse 7. And he broke down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord, where the women, women uh, wove hangings for the grove. They sewed hangings to cover the male phallic symbols that they carried around on a, a stretcher looking thing. Now, the Sodomites, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 17 and 18, God said, you'll have no Sodomites among the sons of Israel. Sodomites are male prostitutes. And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priest had burned incense. Some of those were illegal places of worship of Yahweh. Some, they didn't worship Yahweh, they worshiped idols. From Geba, this is a, a situation in northern Judah, to Beersheba, the very southern border of Judah, and break down the high places of the gates that were in the entering in of the gate of Joshua. This is the only place that the gate of Joshua is listed in God's word. The governor of the city, which were on a man's left hand at the gate of the city. There was a lot of corruption in Judah and Israel that Josiah is taking care of. 
Nevertheless, the priest of the high places came not up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem. They were probably afraid to because they were unclean. Uh, Leviticus chapter 21, verse 17 through 22, the priests that had bodily defects were to be held back from worshiping at the tabernacle also. But they did eat of the unleavened bread among their brethren, not at the holy place. Their brethren, of course, being the Levites, or priest, better said. Verse 10, And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Molech. People were sacrificing their own sons and daughters to Molech, uh, the god of the Moabites. Topheth is, uh, and according to the Smiths, it means a place of burning. Verse 11, And he took away the horses of the kings of Judah that the kings of Judah had given to the sun. These were appointed to worship the sun. More on that in a moment. At the entering in, or near the temple entrance of the house of the Lord, by the chamber of Nathan Malek, which means given of the king, the chamberlain, or eunuch, which was in the suburbs, and burned the chariots of the sun with fire. These dudes would get up every morning as the sun would rise, and they would race their horses and their chariots toward the rising sun as an act of adoration to the sun, as if the sun were the giver of life, not Yahweh, the giver of life. And the altars that were on top of the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord did the king beat down and break them down from thence and cast the dust of them into the brook Kidron. Hezekiah no doubt had destroyed many of these, but Manasseh uh, rebuilt them. In chapter 21, verse 5, we learn that Manasseh, uh, which was probably, is arguably the worst king of Judah, the most evil king of Judah. He caused the streets of Jerusalem to run with innocent blood. But in chapter 21, verse 5, it's written that Manasseh filled the inner and the outer courts of the tabernacle, the temple of God, with altars to the host of heaven. Verse 13, the reason we came here, sharpen up for me. And the high places that were before Jerusalem, which were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had builded for Ashtaroth, the abomination of the Zidonians, and for Chemosh, the abomination of the Moabites, and for Milcom, another name for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon, did the king defile. And uh, this, the, what is the Mount of Corruption? It's the Mount of Olives. That's where G the feet of Jesus Christ will sit down when he returns. Zechariah chapter 14 will document that. Acts uh, chapter 1 verse 11 will also document that Jesus Christ returns to the Mount of Olives. But the Mount of Olives had become a mount of corruption under Solomon. Solomon was a good king for the most part. The first half of his reign, Israel grew. They prospered. He was very fair. He cared about the people. You remember when God came to him in that dream and ask what you will of me. Did Solomon say, well, I'd like a million dollars or I'd like to live to be 180? No, he didn't say that. He said, give me wisdom so I can rule such a great people as Israel. God heard him and gave him wisdom. Wisdom, the, wall, the wisest of all, with the one exception of Jesus Christ in the flesh. But what was his problem? The foreign women. 
Solomon had 700 wives, 300 concubines. That's mind-boggling in itself. I, I don't know how, I mean, well, I'm not going to go there. I love my wife very much. But there's only one of her. And sometimes that's plenty. I, and then I, I should have kept my mouth shut while I was ahead. I'm glad she's up in Sunday school. This is just our little secret, right? Just between me and you. Verse 14. And he break in pieces the images and cut down the groves and filled their places with the bones of men. Again, desecrating these idolatrous places of worship. How did things get that way? I think it's important for us to, to understand how things got to that situation. History has a tendency to repeat itself, and history might just repeat itself again. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 2 as we continue our study on corruption. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Let's pick it up with verse 12. And by the way, where we're at here, Eli, you know, is the high priest, and he's also a judge of Israel. Verse 12, we're at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. This means they were worthless or lawless. They knew not the Lord. Here we have the high priest sons and they don't know the Lord. Bad situation. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething, while it was still boiling in the pot, with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. Now this is not according to God's law. God took care of the priest when someone made a peace offering or a thank offering. The wave breast, the heave shoulder was lifted off. Those are the choicest cuts, by the way. That's like prime rib, if you will. And that was the priest's portion. God made sure that he took care of the priest. But that's not enough for these two jokers. They send their servants around with a big hook and while the, the meat is still in the pot boiling, they sink her down deep and come up with some more. They're getting fat off of the people. You see, the problem with that is that the God gave the priest their portion. What they're stealing is the portion of the offerer. There was a sacrificial meal that was enjoyed any time that there was a peace offering made. And what this priest are doing is stealing the part is, that's the offerer's. Verse 14, and he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron, the cooking utensil in other words, or pot, all that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Shiloh was the first location of the Mosaic tabernacle after the children of Israel crossed the Jordan into the promised land. Verse 15, also, or even worse, before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden or boiled flesh of thee, but raw. We're going to grill some steaks this evening. And we're, we're tired of the, the boiled meat. But here's what they said. They, they said, trim that fat a little extra thick. Now there's a problem with that too, you see. The fat belongs to God. Now I like my ribeye steaks. You know, they got a really good marble to them and a little bit of fat. But God said the fat is mine, verse 16. And if any man, an offerer in other words, said unto him, the one that they sent to get some, uh, cut off some uh, flesh to roast, let them not fail to burn the fat presently. That means without delay. 
and then take as much as they as thy soul desireth. Then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. These are representatives of the priest behaving this way. The offerer said, Before you take what you want, please burn the fat. Even the offerer knew that the fat was God's. The priests were disobeying. Verse 17. Wherefore the sin of the young men, the sons of Eli, was very great before the Lord. For men have bored the offering of the Lord. Not only was he ripping off the people, the offerers, and taking part of their portion, he's taking the portion that belonged to God as well, the fat. God's not happy when his instructions aren't followed. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. Now this is not as the high priest would wear, but it's the, the casual dress of the Levites. Moreover, his mother, that being Hannah, made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year. As the lad grew, he would outgrow the robe that she brought the previous year, so she'd bring one a little larger size. When she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice at Shiloh at the sanctuary. And Eli blessed Elkina, that's the father of Samuel, and his wife, and said, The Lord give thee seed of this woman for the loin which is lent to the Lord, for Samuel who is lent to the Lord. And they went into their own home, and they would be indeed blessed. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. God had shut this woman, uh, Hannah's womb, and now he had opened her womb. Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. That means they lay with them having sexual intercourse. The women who came to serve at the tabernacle defiling the sanctuary itself. Eli knew what his sons were doing was wrong. He was the judge, the judge of Israel. He's the one who decides what's right and what's wrong. He knew what the boys were doing was wrong. Verse 23, And he, this being Eli, said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. People are talking. And it's coming back to my ears. The corruption that you're bringing upon the nation of Israel. You know what? When the leaders of a nation, whether religious or political, when the leaders are corrupt, it spreads. It's like leaven in a loaf of bread Christ would teach in the New Testament. The disciples thought he was talking about leaven that you put in bread to make it rise. He said, that's not what I'm talking about, beloved. I'm talking about the doctrine of the scribes and Pharisees. You put a little false teaching in the loaf, the church, and it spreads throughout the loaf. Corruption is the same way. It spreads throughout the whole nation. And you know what? Even though our nation has seen better days, we've, we've had better leaders, I think, We've had people who worship God instead of the almighty dollar. And we have corruption in the world today. I don't think any of us would argue with that. My point is you can stop the corruption in your family, in your life. God loves you because you want to please him. And to please him, you study his word. But corruption grows in a society when you have religious leaders like Hophni 
and Phinehas, the sons of Eli. What does it say in God's word? If, you're, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out. That's talking about the many-membered body of Christ. If you have a member that offends you, if you have a member that has become corrupt, pluck it out. Put a stop to it. 24, Eli continues to his sons. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. You're causing a public scandal with your behavior. You make the Lord's people to transgress. There we have it. Corrupt leaders cause the people to be corrupt and transgress as well. If one man sin against another, another man in other words, the judge, that being God, shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Who will uh, intercede or arbitrate for him? Today, of course, we have the intercessor Jesus Christ. Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. They had already been given up to the judgment of hardening of their hearts. This family of the high priest, Eli, were descendants of Ithamar, the fourth son of Aaron. That's not where the high priesthood was supposed to be. The high priesthood was supposed to be of Eleazar, the third son of Aaron. Why? Because of the zealousness of Phinehas, not to be concerned, uh, uh, confused with Eli's son Phinehas. When he went in with that Israelite and a Moabitish woman, and uh, Israel was being seduced by the Moabites, God sent a plague among the people. Uh, Phinehas went in and ran both of them through with a spear, uh, putting an end to the plague. The pre high priesthood, my point, was supposed to be from the descendants of Eleazar. How it came to be under Ithamar, but that would come to an end because of this behavior of Eli and his two sons. Corrupt priests can lead people astray. Corrupt kings and judges can also cause people to suffer. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 21. First Kings chapter 21, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard or near by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Now Ahab and Jezebel had a summer house or palace that was in Jezreel. Verse 2, And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs. I'd like to plant some vegetables this year. Because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. Now, at least... Ahab is offering to uh, recompense Naboth for his property. Jezebel's not going to be so nice. But of course, it's illegal for someone of Israel to sell their inheritance. God would look upon that like he looked upon Esau trading his inheritance for that bowl of red pottage. Verse 3. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give or sell the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. Verse 4, And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased. He was sad and angry because the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. He didn't want to see anybody. He didn't want to talk to anybody. Ahab was pouting. 
Jezebel is about to see red. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? We just came from the big city and we're here at our summer home. You should be happy. I want you to be happy. I know something is wrong. Tell me what's wrong, Pooh Bear. You know, that's, it's, un, it's not written, but that's what Jezebel called Ahab. She called him Pooh Bear. And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. Jezebel is about to go ballistic. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Are you the king or not? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. It wasn't hers to give, but she thinks it's hers to take. Ahab didn't say anything to Jezebel about God forbid me from giving up my inheritance or selling my inheritance. He refused Ahab based on his religious convictions. Of course, if Ahab had mentioned that to Jezebel, it wouldn't have meant anything to her anyway. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, forgery, and sealed them with his seal. She took some hot wax and dripped it on the closing of the letter and took the king's signet ring and made an impression in the hot wax and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth to the Jezreelites. Verse 9, And she wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast. Now this would be bad news for the people of Jezreel. This is a sign that a really heavy sin or guilt is fallen upon the people of Jezreel. And set Naboth on high among the people. We're having court today. You, the elders of Jezreel, are the judges. Naboth is the accused, the defendant. Verse 10. And set two men, sons of Belial, these are worthless or lawless men, before him to bear witness against him, to bear false witness against him saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king. This word blaspheme in the Hebrew is barak. And it means, believe it or not, to bless. But by euphemism, it means to curse God or the king. Thou didst blaspheme God and the king. And then carry him out and stone him that he may die. Verse 11. And the men of his city, Jezreel, Even the elders and the nobles, well, they weren't very noble in this case, who were the inhabitants in his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. They didn't even fight it. They didn't put up any protest at all. And this serves as a witness to how corrupt the nation had had become and how fearful the people were of Jezebel. They proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. It's time for kangaroo court. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him. They lied, even against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 26, we learn that Naboth's sons were also stoned at this time. You say, what was it that Ahab wanted? He wanted Naboth's vineyard. If Naboth was dead and he had sons... 
whose would the vineyard be? Naboth's sons. So she took care of Naboth and his sons. Then they sent to Jezebel saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. Mission of deceit and murder carried out. In Genesis chapter 4 verse 10, when Cain slew his brother Abel, you remember the blood of Abel, righteous Abel, cried out from the ground to the Lord? I know the blood of Naboth cried out to the Lord as well. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money, for Naboth is not alive, but dead. Now you can plant your vegetable garden, Pooh Bear. And it came to pass when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite and take possession of it. Verse 17, And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishput, saying, this is Elijah the prophet, Arise, go down to meet Ahab king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it, illegally possess it. And you can't con God. You can't hide anything from God. God knows exactly what Ahab did and Jezebel. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? This is ratzach in the Hebrew, the killed. Especially it means to murder. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine that would come to pass as well. Ahab would not die and the dogs lick up his blood in the vineyard of Naboth. But Ahab's son died and they took his body and threw it in the vineyard of Naboth that it could be fulfilled what Elijah the prophet said. The dogs will lick up your blood and the blood that threw flow flowed through Ahab's son was just like Ahab's. People like Ahab and Jezebel trust in their possessions and their wealth for their salvation, that they would not see corruption. Turn with me to Psalms chapter 49. Psalm 49, a psalm for the sons of Korah, probably written uh, by Hezekiah and handed over for public use in temple worship. Psalm 49, verse 1, and it reads, Hear this, all ye people. Give ear, all ye inhabitants of the world. This word world in the Hebrew is kaled. It means life as a fleeting moment. And you know what? Life in the flesh is but a fleeting moment compared to the eternity. The blink of an eye compared to the eternity. But this applies to all of you is what he's saying. Both low and high, rich and poor together. This applies to all of you. There are no exceptions. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and the meditation of my heart, or my mind, shall be of understanding. Do you want wisdom and understanding? Listen up, you're about to hear it. I will incline mine ear to a parable, and one follows. I will open my dark saying upon the harp. My deep saying would be a better translation. And the word open, it means to unlock, is to unlock a revelation. Kind of like the key of David in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 and the following verses. That key that opens doors that no man can shut. And I'm adding this myself, that key that opens God's word where we can understand it and no man can 
shut it. Verse 5. Wherefore should I hear in the days of evil when the iniquity of my heel shall compass me about? First prophecy of God's word. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 concerning the serpent. God said to the, to the serpent and the woman, I'm going to put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. And it, the seed of the serpent, will bruise his heel. And it certainly did when they nailed his feet to that cross. But he, it, the, the seed of the woman, shall bruise his head. That's going to happen in the future. Verse 6. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. Those who depend on that wealth for their salvation. Now, there's nothing wrong with being successful in your riches as long as they're the results of hard work and, and doing things right in business. This is talking about people who have ill-gotten gains, just to be frank. Verse 7, None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. Souls are not for sale. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse soul, God says, all souls are mine. He didn't say, well, for $5.95, I'll let you redeem yours. No, they're not for sale. There's only one who could pay the price. For the redemption of their soul is precious, it's costly, and it ceaseth forever. There's only one, again, who could pay the price for, to redeem souls. That, of course, was Jesus Christ. Verse 9. That he, this is the brother, should still live forever and not see corruption. Man's tried from early on, Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babylon. What was that all about? They were trying to create their own salvation. If it ever floods again like it did 200 years ago in the days of Noah, we can climb that ladder to heaven and save ourselves. God didn't like it. He came down. And that's when he put languages among the people to be a, a confusion to them. Today, we have those who think cryonics, cryogenics, I guess they call it. That's where, you know, they freeze their, their body, and if they're on a budget, they just freeze their head, uh, thinking that when science has advanced, we can thaw them out. And if, if those people who are on a budget and we just thaw out their head, by then they'll have technology so advanced they can just pop it on a head or on a body, and they'll be good to go. You hear about cloning today. That's Man trying to create his own salvation. It's going to make God come down again. This time, though, he's not coming back as a babe in swaddling clothes. He's coming back on a white war horse with a rod of iron for correction. I say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Only he can straighten out this corrupted world that we live in. Verse 10. For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool, and the brutish person perish, and leave their wealth to others. Everybody is going to die. And I don't care how much money you got with you, you're not going to take it with you when you check out. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, there's only one thing you can take with you. That's your works. Good, bad, or ugly, your works do follow you. We're going to be judged by them. Verse 11, their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever. Their family is going to live forever. And their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. They call it the Smith Ranch, the Alexander Farm. It's not their land. God's loaning it to them. We're all sojourners here, visitors. Nevertheless, man being an honor abideth not, not permanently. 
He is like the beast that perish. All the pomp and riches are an outward show aren't going to do you any good when you die. This their way is their folly. And their posterity, their children, approve their saying, Selah. Sounds good to me, Pops. I like the sound of Alexander Farms. The Selah, stop, pause, meditate in, in the, the original text. And here the Selah is connecting the fact that's going to follow in verse 14 with their thought in verses 11 and 12 explaining their folly. Like sheep, they are laid in the grave, Sheol in the Hebrew. Death, that's Satan, shall feed on them. And the upright, the Zadok, shall have dominion over them in the morning. Spiritually, you could think of this as the first resurrection of Revelation chapter 20. And their beauty, or their refuge, shall consume in the grave from their dwelling, from their previous lofty house that they thought would be uh, around forever and ever and ever without end is ended up in the grave. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me, Selah. Stop, pause, meditate, connecting the fear and folly of the hopeless with the true hope, uh, which removes fear. Or 16, be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, boy, I just don't understand it. The wicked people always get ahead. They're always got lots of money. They drive nice car. They got, they got nice clothes. And, and they're wicked. They're evil. There's an acrostic psalm, Psalm 37, hidden in that acrostic in verses 7, 20, and 34. It tells you what happens to the wicked. They end up in the lake of fire. And you, the righteous, are going to have a front row seat when they go in. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. His riches and his wealth aren't going with him. Though while he lived, he blessed his soul himself. And men will praise thee when thou dost well to thyself. Verse 19, he shall go to the generation of his fathers. All of us die. They shall never see light, light symbolic of truth. Man that is in honor, in his own self-glory, and understandeth not, is like the beasts that perish. All the riches, all the wealth can't save them. In conclusion, turn with me to the book of Galatians. In the New Testament... When you get to Corinthians, right after 2 Corinthians, you'll find Galatians. We're going to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 5, we learn what the fruit of the flesh is and also the fruit of the Spirit. Everything dealing with the flesh, the fruit of the flesh is evil and wicked, uh, everything that's uh, good is the fruit of the Spirit. Chapter 6, verse 1, as we close. Brethren, if or although a man be overtaken in a fault, uh, in an error or a sin, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You could say, you know what, that could have happened to me. Or, or, or there by the grace of God, go I. That could be me. So don't be so quick to judge your brother and condemn your brother. If he falls short, help him up. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What was the law of Christ? Love your brother as you love yourself. Burdens, by the way, are not given by God. You want to be careful not to say, 
the burden of the Lord. Read Jeremiah chapter 23 if you think it's all right to say, oh, look at the burdens God placed on me. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Boy, that could put a hat pin in your ego bubble. Pow! My wife has one of those. Hat, not an ego. A hat pin. Pow! She's good with it too. Verse 4. But let every man prove or examine his own work. And when... And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. You can be proud of, of your work and, and your contributions to society. The good things that you do for other people. It's good to be proud of those. You don't need a hot hat pin to pop that. that that's good. But remember we were talking about egos earlier. No need to compare your work with the works of others either. We are a many-membered body, and not everyone has, is the mouthpiece, the mouth. We need a big toe. We, we need a stomach. We, we, we need all the different parts of the body, and my point is we all have different gifts. So don't compare what you do with what others do. Verse 5. For every man shall bear his own burden. And Moffat translates this, the load of his responsibility. The burden here is a different word than what we see in, in verse 2, verse 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. That's what we should do when we learn God's word. Teach it to others. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. God's not going to be ridiculed. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Rewards, blessings for some, chastisement and punishment for others. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap Ever life everlasting. How do you avoid corruption? Sow to the spirit. Let, let your spirit man be in charge of your flesh man. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not, if we don't quit, if, if we persevere. Verse 10 to conclude, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men especially unto them who are of the household of the faith to fellow Christians. I want you to do your best not to allow the corruption of the world to corrupt you. Order it out of your home, away from your family, away from your life in the name of Jesus Christ. Sow to the Spirit and reap life everlasting. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Father, your word that, that opens our eyes and opens our ears to your truth, Father. We thank you for that. And you have a group here that wants to serve you, Father. I ask you to continue, Father, revealing your will to us, Father. Uh, continue to, to communicate to us through your word, Father. Uh, we ask for revelation. In Jesus' precious name, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736.
Don't be deceived by Satan. I'm having trouble with your writing. First of all, this is from Helen in Pennsylvania. Uh, let's see here. About, about one year ago, Arnold and Dennis, I started watching about one year ago, Arnold and Dennis, for, and thank you for helping me to understand the word better. You're good in what they are doing. Your stations, I guess, or staff. Um, thank you for that. I'm glad you're on TV. I believe in God and Jesus. Uh, he saved my life so many times. Uh, my question, what happened to Joseph how did he die? And I'm going to assume you're talking about Joseph uh, of the New Testament, the stepfather of Jesus. Well, uh, it's not written what happened to Joseph. Uh, historically, it's documented that Jesus made several uh, journeys from the Middle East to Glastonbury, England with, his, uh, uh, with Mary's uncle, Joseph of Arimathea. Um, and what happened to, um, and I assume he died, uh, what happened to Mary? Uh, we, have, we have a book in our library, book number 22, called Drama of the Lost Disciples. It's a $17 donation. It's a very good read if you want to know what happened to Mary after the crucifixion. Out of time, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in depth. You know, it makes his day when he looks down and he sees you reading the letter that he wrote to you. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others of your brothers and sisters who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing that's most important though, beloved, it's this. You stay in His Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.